<laughs> always have always time for little joy it's a simple thing for life and yes i'm also content to be the afternoon king well good afternoon you came back <laughs> yeah well i'm uh Happy to talk a little bit more about spiritual leadership. So let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you again for another opportunity that you give to us, Lord, to, to share about spiritual leadership. We, we thank you for your call on our lives. Mm -hmm. We thank you for examples that you've given to us. We thank you for the heritage that we have, Lord, um, through this church. And we thank you that it is being built upon, Lord, by the present generation. And so we pray that you would equip us and strengthen us and allow us to be good stewards of of what you've given to us and, and where we are so that, Lord, we might pass on to the next generation, Father, uh, uh, treasures and, and building blocks that they can also use to be faithful in how you will call them. So, um, for this afternoon, we ask for your direction, your guidance, and help us, Lord, to look to you for teaching us this afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray. Um, do you know how the lion rules the jungle? Huh? <laughs> well, um, let me tell you a story which illustrates how the lion ruled the jungle. The lion was proud of his mastery of the animal kingdom. One day he decided to make sure all the animals, all the other animals knew that he was the king of the jungle. He was so confident that he bypassed the smaller animals and went straight to the bear. Who is the king of the jungle? The lion asked. The bear replied, why, you are, of course. The lion gave a mighty roar of approval. Next, he asked the tiger, who is the king of the jungle? The tiger quickly responded, everyone knows that you are mighty lion. Lion gave a mighty roar of approval. Next on the list was the elephant. The lion faced the elephant and addressed his question. Who is the king of the jungle? The elephant immediately grabbed the lion with his trunk whirled him around in the air five times, slammed him into a tree. Then he pounded him onto the ground several times, dumped him underwater in a nearby lake, and finally dumped him out on the shore. The lion, beaten, battered, and bruised, struggled to his feet. He looked at the elephant through sad and bloody eyes and said, look, 
just because you don't know the answer is no reason for you to get reading. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, the, the, the lion uh, rules the jungle by intimidation. He wants everyone to be afraid. There are sometimes problems with leadership, um, wishy-washy, or some of the word we can use to describe leadership, manipulative, tyrannical, abusive, despotic, deceitful, untrustworthy, coercive, intimidator, selfish, incompetent, impotent, coward, etc. But the type of leadership that we should be interested in exemplifying, practicing, embracing, giving uh, an environment to and a culture for is what we can call servant leadership. But what exactly is that? It almost sounds paradoxical. Servant leadership. <coughs> but servant leadership is not about controlling people. It's about developing. People are the most valuable assets and resources the church has. Therefore, they must be handled with the greatest care and stewardship. So do we know what servant leadership looks like? I want to give us um, a, a picture, a model. And, and Jesus Christ, of course, is our prime example. He is our supreme leader. He is the one to whom we look. And we can see true biblical leadership from him. Because certainly, if we can't see that in Jesus, where else would we look? And so I want to, to give us uh, five words that define and model servant leadership as shown to us by Jesus. Um, those five words. Uh, uh, three S's and two E's. That is, they will, they will begin with three S's and two E's. The first S is that servant leadership, I believe, is shared leadership. I think we need to see more of um, shared leadership rather than leadership where there is one person who has the feeling or is given the the, the sense that I am the leader and everybody else is uh, falls somewhere else under me. But um, shared leadership, I think, um, is, is, is the way to go. Uh, and, and Jesus said in, in John 15, I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything, Jesus said, that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Everything that I have learned from my father, I made known to you. Do you realize that Jesus took these 12 guys and poured himself into them? taught them. Now, now, first of all, I would, uh, would bet that if you and I were given the chance of selecting the 12 disciples, we wouldn't choose those guys. Those were as, 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 as unworthy, as uh, unbecoming of, of being disciples of Jesus as you could find. But Jesus took them and says, for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. 
Then he said, you have not chosen me in John 15, but I have chosen you and gave you this work. Jesus could have done everything. Jesus could simply speak and everything that he wanted to, to happen would just happen. Uh, he could just miraculously um, make things happen. He did not do that. He worked with these guys. He was perfect at everything, yet he chose imperfect, bumbling disciples. Why did he give them everything? Because he did not plan to stay. He knew that he was going to be around forever, physically here on earth. That's true for, for all of us. We're not going to be here long. Um, now, one difference certainly between us and Jesus is that we really don't know when we're, we're going to go. But, but I think that in our minds, we should keep it that we are going to go one day. And the truth is, it could be tomorrow. It could be this evening. We just don't know. So, um, so I, I think one of our one of our goals um, that that is worthwhile is um, everything you know. Is there somebody that you need to share that with? Is there somebody you need to be passing on to? What do you know? And you know a lot. You've, you've, you've done a lot of studying. You've done a lot of um, reading. You've done a lot of researching. You've, you've built up a, a, a tremendous uh, amount of of stuff, knowledge, information, you have it. And the truth is that if you don't pass that on, when you die, then it dies. Uh, we were just talking about cemeteries. Well, cemeteries are, cemeteries are full of, of unfulfilled dreams. Mm -hmm. They're full of all kinds of knowledge. They're full of, they're full of so much information that, that people have that, that that's where they are. They're in the cemetery because they were not passed on to anyone. Who do you need to be sharing your leadership with? Whatever, whatever is the level of your leadership, whatever is the, the area of your leadership, it doesn't matter. Um, but, but share it. And, and you may say, you know, I'm looking for the right person. Well, you know, were those 12 guys the right people? Hmm. I mean, they, they, they missed it a lot. They just didn't get it. How many times did Jesus say to them, oh, you have little faith? How many times did he have to rebuke them? You know, he said to Peter, um, Satan has, has chosen to sift you as wheat, as wheat because uh, Peter just didn't get it. He talked about um, leaving earth and the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of sinners. And Peter said, not, not, not all over my dead body and all of those kinds of things. I will never let it happen. So he just didn't get it a lot. But, but Jesus kept, kept giving, kept pouring, kept teaching, kept ministering, kept um, equipping, kept showing. And uh, and and um, when 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 Jesus was was um, uh, taken uh, captive and about to be crucified, and uh, the little young lady um, said, uh, pointed to Peter and said, "I I've seen you with him. I know that you're one of his." And the Bible says, Peter cursed and swore and said, I don't know this man. 
Now that same Peter, just a few weeks later, on the day of Pentecost, when Jesus was no longer here physically, stood up in Acts chapter 2 and preached a sermon that at the end of it, 3,000 people said yes to Jesus. That same Peter. So the point I'm making is that, that Jesus understood what shared leadership was. He was turning over the leadership of the church to 12 guys who, if we were grading them, they would not be ready. And by the way, when Jesus was, uh, when it was time for him to leave and he was now ascending to his father, Jesus didn't look at those guys and say, you know, I, they're not ready. I need to stay for six more months. <laughs> I need to extend my stay and get them a little bit more prepared. 35 more years, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, he didn't. When it was time, he left. And he left those guys. Those were the leaders of the church. He left the ministry of the church in those hands, in the, in the hands of those guys. Matthew uh, um, 28, when, when he said, go into all the world and, and, and preach the gospel. And those were the guys he was talking to. So certain leadership is shared leadership. Um, so let me read you another fictional letter, which is a great example of how we might have looked at those early disciples. Um, it says, uh, dear sir, thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men you have picked for managerial positions in your new organization. All of them have now taken the battery of tests and we have run them through our computers. It is the staff's opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, educational and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise you're undertaking. They do not have the team concept. We would suggest that you continue your search for persons with experience and proven capability. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has no leadership skills at all. The two brothers, James and John, place personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale. We feel that it is our duty to inform you that Matthew has been backlisted, uh, blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. <laughs> James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, have radical leanings and registered high manic depressive scores. Only one of them shows that he has the motivation, the aptitude, the passion, the drive, the ambition for good leadership and management, and that is Judas Iscariot. <laughs> no matter how much you may learn, achieve, accumulate, or accomplish, if it all dies with you, then you are a failure. Your influence will not continue in banks and buildings, mm -hmm. bank accounts. Your influence will only continue in people. So we, we must be sharing ourselves with people. 
have a goal of passing on to someone everything you know, everything you have, everything you have learned. I do not pretend that this is an easy thing to do. It's, it's hard. Most of us, this is difficult. But it, it's what we shoot for. It's when we understand the value of shared leadership, that this is part of servant leadership. And it's when we understand that our Lord Jesus Christ did this. Okay? Now, if Jesus did this, when, when he could have done everything perfectly, could have done everything by himself, didn't have any need for anybody else, then how much more should we do it? Because we certainly are not perfect, and we certainly um, have the need to have others share with us in whatever we're doing in terms of ministry. All right, so shared leadership is servant leadership. Number two, um, servant leadership is also secure <coughs> leadership. It's secure leadership. Jesus was not threatened by the disciples' successors. He taught them everything he knew. He poured into them. He allowed them to exercise leadership. He gave them responsibility. He was working himself out of a job. Again, he knew that he was going to be going away. He had no issues with those guys taking over and being responsible for the, the job that was going to be left. The greatest leadership challenge is establishing the priority of self-replacement. Greatest leadership challenge is the establishing of the priority of self-replacement. Again, that's a difficult thing. But um, when, when we are in positions of responsibility, when we're in positions of leadership, one of our goals should be to, re to replace us. Work ourselves out of a job. Work to have someone replace us. If we are secure, that's not a problem. The, the, that gives us a problem when we are insecure and we think, you know, I'm not going to ask that guy to preach um, because he actually may preach better than me. And the people might actually like when he preaches. I'm not going to ask this person to do this assignment because they may actually do better than me. But also there are times when we think uh, they can't do it as good as I can. So therefore I won't ask them to do it. Um, I'm just gonna do it myself. But, but either way, those are insecurities that we have. And that's not good. Our goal as leaders is to produce people who are greater than ourselves. Jesus said for uh, John 14, 12, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. The spirit of insecurity, the spirit of low self-esteem, the spirit of poor self-concept, the spirit of devalued self-worth, always will focus on self-preservation and self-protection, which uh, are um, making us have a defensive perspective in our lives. And that spirit of insecurity breeds the attitude of fear and suspicion and distrust. And insecure leaders see colleagues as enemies and partners as competitors. So we must guard ourselves against insecure leadership. We must be secure. And, and how, is it, how is it that we're secure? We're secure because of who we are in Jesus Christ. We're secure because 
of, of who God made us to be. We're insecure. We're secure because of what God has entrusted to us. We're secure because we've been made in the image of God. We're secure because we don't need to compete with anybody else. But God, God does not ask me to be like anybody else except him. So I don't have to try to compete. I don't have to try to do things. Um, uh, I don't have to be the, uh, I don't have to give children's messages with a car. I don't have to be that way. I don't have to be able to sing like that. Because what God has given to me, he holds me responsible for. God does not hold me responsible for anything that he does give to me. He holds me responsible for what he's given to me. I can be absolutely secure. So therefore, I can serve in the ways that God has equipped me and given me opportunities to serve, and I don't have to compete with anybody else. I don't have to fight anybody for any position. We have people in churches fighting for positions. That's all insecurity. If my life is, is um, in the hands of God, if I have surrendered myself to God, then nobody can take from me anything that God wants me to have. Nobody. Nobody can rob me of anything that God wants for me. It's all taken care of. I, I've given myself to God. So, so, it's, so it's his. It's his business. I don't have to fight for it. By the way, People who are manipulative in leadership, that's a dead giveaway that, that they don't trust God. If you truly trust God, why would you need to manipulate to get your way? Yeah, I don't think those two come. By being manipulative in leadership, you are saying you don't trust God. You're saying, I have to make this work. I have to, to make this happen. And, and I have to do it just any way that I can. Uh, um, I, ca I can't depend on God to work this out. I've got to do it myself. So, so there's a there's a lack of trust in God. All right, so um, servant leadership is shared leadership. Uh, it is secure leadership. It is succession leadership. It is succession leadership. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, but it's kind of building on the on what I've been talking about. Matthew 17, 22 through 24. Uh, when they came together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. I've told you this um, so that when the time comes, you will remember, uh, this is uh, John 16. Verses four through seven. I have told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first because I was with you. Now I'm going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I'm going away. Wow. I wonder if they had to be convinced about that. It is for your good that I'm going away. 
Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus knew he was not going to be around physically for a long time. He saw his departure as a trigger for greater success and progress for his successors. And he was determined to leave them for the sake of the organization's success. You know, something that happens sometimes is that uh, people are in other people's shadows. Maybe you've kind of heard that or seen that or experienced that. Um, uh, once someone is there in a particular position doing certain things, occupying certain places, then there are those who may just not emerge. Uh, because they think, well, so-and-so is always there. So-and-so does it. So-and-so does it well. But I have seen um, quite a number of times where uh, someone leaves. Someone who has been good at what they do. Someone who has been a good leader. And all of a sudden, it seems, somebody emerges who you just didn't really see before. but it's because somebody has left. So in some ways, there's a vacancy that has been created. In some ways, it just leaves a, a hole. But in other ways, what it does is that it's providing a, a kind of a, a, an environment now where this person or these people who have been in the background, who have been in the shadows, uh, can come forth. There's more of a need. So, um, so when, it, when there's time for transition, when people need to leave uh, places and so on, don't, don't just see that as something negative. Of course, we, we struggle with separation anxiety and we don't like to, to have anybody leave anywhere, uh, except it's really um, somebody that we don't like or, uh, or it's obvious that they really should leave. Um, you know, but, but, but many times, uh, someone who we have come to, to, to love and become really connected with and so on, um, maybe even in a leadership role, and they have to leave. You know, one pastor leaving one church to go to another church um, are just moving into a different uh, role and capacity. And yes, we're going to miss that person and all of that. But if things have been going well, then that person has been sharing with others, and there are others who are going to step in, and others who are going to emerge. And, uh, and there, is, there, is, there is one leader who said that the greatest uh, testament to your leadership legacy is if your organization does better after you leave. Because the, the implication would be that you have put so much in, you have done so much, you have shared so much that, that when you leave, there is so much that you have invested that it's going to make them even better after you. Many times what we see happening is that after a good, strong leader, many times organizations don't do very well because they were, they were riding on the coattails, as it were, of that good leader. Now the leader might have been really good, but, but if time is not spent in sharing and investing in, the, in those who are there, then when that leader goes, a lot is going to go. There, there's not going to be the organizational um, um, legacy and stability that will remain. It, it, it's really going to go with the, with the leader. So, uh, so Jesus says, um, he, he saw his departure as a trigger for greater success and progress for his um, successors. There is no success without successors. 
It is not what leaders achieve that counts. It is what they transfer. It's not what leaders achieve that counts. It's what they transfer to others. Success is not what is not what happens while you're alive or while you are in your position. It is what happens after you leave. Two, ma two major mistakes that leaders make are to believe that they are the only ones who could and should fulfill the vision and to think. So, so one, one mistake, one major mistake is to think that they're the only ones who should or could fulfill the vision. The second major mistake is for them to think that they should fulfill the vision in their lifetime. In other words, you, you are there as a leader and you think everything needs to happen while I am here. I'm suggesting that that is, that is myopic, that is short sighted. I certainly need to do well with, with my leg of the, of the race, with the, with the baton while I have it, but I am not either the beginning or the end of the race. I, I need to run my leg well, but I am passing the baton on to somebody else. I don't know exactly when, but I'm going to. And so the whole, the, the entire race is not my leg. My leg is just one part of the race. I'm not trying to run the whole race. That was not meant to be. So everything does not have to be accomplished in my life then. I need to have a vision that is beyond me. I need to have a vision that, that goes beyond where I'm, I'm here. Succession uh, leadership. We, we're, we're passing the baton on. Power, authority, and influence can be addicting and intoxicating. Servant leaders must resist those temptations. They must know when to leave a position. They must be secure enough to know when to depart. It takes courage to make yourself unnecessary. It takes courage to make yourself unnecessary. It takes courage to train your replacement. It takes courage to work yourself out of a job. Um, one, one leader said, the day you start a new job, a new position, a new leadership opportunity, the day you start, you prepare to leave. The first day you prepare to leave. Because you, you understand that you will not be there forever. Don't know when it is that you're going to be going, but you know that you're going to go one day. Uh, there are, we, 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 we've seen, we've heard of situations where um, a leader dies suddenly. Just stop. No expectation, no warning. Just dies. And um, we've seen that in many cases, um, it has, it has just devastated their organization or whatever it was that they were leading because there was very little preparation for, for that to happen. That can happen to any one of us. I'm not trying to be morbid, but, but I'm, just, I'm just saying that that's a reality that we all need to just give some thought to. So one question that I suggest that we ask is, in whatever capacity we are, wherever we're uh, giving leadership and serving, 
just ask yourself the question if I were to leave what I'm doing and where I am right now, today, what would happen to the organization that I'm giving leadership to? If, to, if, if today is my last day, I'm done after today, for whatever reason, what's, what's gonna happen? Are there some plans? Is there some grooming taking place? Is there some mentoring taking place with, with some others that are there? So that if that were to happen, there would be some continuity and the organization would not be in such really bad shape. So um, share leadership, secure leadership, succession leadership, and then number four, servant leadership is empowered leadership. Empowered leadership. Empowered leadership. Um, in Matthew 10, verse one, let's see. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Again, I ask you to think, imagine Jesus did this to these 12 guys. He put his authority in them. This is Matthew 10. Um, so, so they're, they're, let's just, they're not ready. They're not ready. They're just not. But, but Jesus gave these 10, these 12 guys, his authority. He says, uh, he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. He didn't hold back. He didn't say, let me, let me, let me give it to them gradually. Let me give the authority to them to authority to them incrementally. He empowered them. He, he thrust them into responsibility with his authority. I don't think that he tried to micromanage them, but they had his authority. And again, we, we have many, many evidences that they were not ready. Remember one time they went out and, and they were shot themselves because they came back to Jesus and said, listen, uh, master, the demons are subject to us. Demons are subject to us. I mean, they were so surprised that, that they could do things in the name of Jesus. He gave it to them, he empowered them. We tend to hold back many times because we think, yeah, you know, they're too young, they're too immature. And, and you know, there is, there is, there is a reality to all of that. Uh, but what I'm saying is that we need to understand that we've got to, to do more empowering. And if, if many of us would think of our own experiences and our own journey, we would realize that people entrusted some things to us at, at a time when they had no business there. <laughs> they took some huge risks. But, that, but that's, that's part of the journey. They, they, we want to build a culture that does that. We want to build an, a whole environment that does that. Every one of us want to be sharing in that kind of thinking, that, that kind of understanding, that kind of um, um, teaching, so that it's the whole environment that is like that. We all understand the same principles that we're working on. 
All right, and then uh, number five, uh, servant leadership is also equipping leadership. So it's shared leadership, it's secure leadership, it's succession leadership, it is empowered leadership, and it is equipping leadership. Servant leaders invest in people. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, uh, Jesus says, go into all the world. All authority is given to me. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As the Father has sent me, Jesus said to his disciples, so send I you. Jesus, Jesus entrusted the evangelizing and discipling of the entire world in the hands of 12 men who he equipped for the task. Equipping leadership. Equipping is, is, is difficult. You know, we spend our time uh, with people, investing in them, working with them, and um, we think that we've gotten them to a really good place, and then all of a sudden, boy, either they're gone, we don't see them, or they're just on a different track, you know? Uh, maybe you heard about the, the, um, the pastor who left the pastorate and became a funeral director. And so, um, you know, there were people who were kind of curious and, and, and just uh, mystified and wondering, well, you know, why, why, why did he leave the pastorate and, um, and, and, and went into funeral directing? And so, so the guy said, well, you know, when I, when I was a pastor, I would work with a couple and I, you know, I would spend time with them. My wife and I would, you know, they would have, they would be having struggles and problems in their marriage and, and we would uh, go to their home and, and, and just counsel with them and work with them and we'd get them to a good place and, and we'd spend um, several sessions with them and they'd be doing better and on a good path. And, uh, and then, you know, we may not see them for a few months and then after a few months, we hear from them again and boy, they have, it's like we, we never did anything with them. They're just back um, um, where they were. Or we would work with someone who was on drugs and we would uh, just really, really labor with them, agonize with them, um, um, get them off drugs and get them on a good path and in recovery and all of that. And then we wouldn't see them for a little while. And the next thing we know, boy, they're back on drugs. And he said, man, I, I, I just got so frustrated with that. Um, so, you know, when I started now my funeral directing, well, when I straighten them out, they stay straight. <laughs> <laughs> so equipping is difficult <laughs> because you can spend a lot of energy and effort with someone and, uh, and it doesn't work out. That's just a, a reality. But it's what we've got to do anyway. It doesn't change that that, that, that needs to be our MO. Servant leadership is equipping leadership. Our Lord built an organization at 30 years old that is now more than 2,000 years old. It is the largest company on earth with upward of 2 billion clients. I happen to work for that company. He started it with just 12 investors to whom he gave shares. They did not have to buy them. The greatest leader of all time gave these shares to the partners by passing on knowledge So that's Jesus's model. Now, if we say, I think I want to do it another way. Just think of what that would mean that we're saying. We would be then saying, 
that we know better than you. And we have a better system and we have figured out a better way than you to, to be servant leaders and to, uh, to pass on a legacy for leadership. So I don't think it would be very convincing that we have a better way or that we can do it better. This is how Jesus did it. He took some guys who were very imperfect, like we are, and he poured into them. He entrusted things to them, gave them his authority, and he left. Um, I, I'm so we're 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 I'm, I'm closing this this part and um, I just thought this is interesting. Um, it's entitled "A Wanted Man." If Jesus had entered into one of our modern cities leading the parade, he would have been arrested immediately. He would be a wanted man. The FDA would want him for turning water into wine without the license. <laughs> The EPA would have wanted him for killing fig trees. <laughs> the AMA for practicing medicine without a license. <laughs> the Department of Health would have wanted him for asking people to open graves, for raising the dead, and for feeding 5,000 people in the wilderness without a food permit. <laughs> the NEA uh, would have had problems with him for teaching without a certificate. The OSHA would have had problems with him for walking on water without a life jacket. <laughs> <laughs> the SPCA would have problems with him for driving hogs into the sea. The National Board of Psychiatrists for giving, uh, would have problems with him for giving advice on how to live a guilt-free life. And the NOW would have problems with him for not choosing a woman disciple. <laughs> <laughs> The Abortion Rights League would have had problems with him for saying that whoever harms children, it is better that they had never been born. The interfaith movement would have had problems with him for condemning all other religions. And the zoning department would have had problems with him for building a temple in three days without permits. <laughs> so Jesus was radical. He gave all kinds of people all kinds of problems. But Jesus is our model. As a matter of fact, Jesus had big problems with the church people. The church people had his big, some of his biggest problems with the church people, the religious people. So, so Jesus is showing us, I think, that that's not what he's about. He's not about religion. He's not about uh, a churchianity. He's not about um, us, us um, seeking to, to preserve sacred cows. No. He's about what makes people's lives transform. Where they're no longer um, helpless about their condition, but they, they place themselves in his hands and he does a transforming work that he invites, he does it in us and then he invites us to help him to do it in ours. And, and that, that, that's it. All right, so we'll we'll take a break, and then um, if you come back, then we'll we'll have one we'll have, we'll have one more uh, about an hour. All right. Talk to you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> like, ten minutes or so. On, um, on our final lap here. This is our way to the Yes. <laughs> And uh, 
Um, you have come back again. So that's good. Okay. Well, um, are there any any thoughts or any questions from uh, what we talked about in our last hour? Anyone wants to share? I have, I have yes. a question. Okay, so I had a question from what you said. If I were to leave what I'm doing today, what would happen to the leadership for continue? And I'm thinking in some things I don't see someone that has the skill set that I have, but I don't think that matters because Jesus knew that they weren't exactly ready. It's more the investing in the people part. Is that what I'm getting? Well, Am I getting uh, that right? yes. So I think yes, we are we're developing people and we're building people. So that is that that needs to be just a continuous thing um, at all times. Um, but also, so so that's a that's on a broad and general um, basis, yeah, and we should be doing it. Uh, but also specifically, I, I think we should be looking now. Um, for many of us, we really may not see someone that has uh, that has our skill sets, especially those. Of us who let's say that uh, some of us are more gifted, more accomplished than, than others. Um, so it, it may be very difficult to actually uh, see someone who has everything that you're looking for. But, but keep in mind that um, you didn't get to where you are um, in a day. And there was a time when you didn't have any of that and, and and probably somebody did invest in you or open a door for you or gave you a chance when you didn't have much so so what i'm saying is you you're not going to find the perfect candidate probably but just let's look look for potential look for uh, people with that you see the right attitude, the right heart in, uh, people who are willing to serve. Um, and yes, look for look for some abilities and some skills, um, but potential. Because they really may not be where you really want them to be, but part of your job is to help them to get there. Help them to develop, help them to grow. So, yeah, because again, um, if you go, go back to the, the Jesus' model, none of these guys had um, what Jesus really, what was really needed. Um, they started out very, very inadequate, very um, uh, undeserving from any measure. But then um, you realize that, that the, the historical record seems to suggest that, that all of the, the apostles probably died martyrs' deaths, um, which meant that, that by the time they came to the end of their lives, they were very different from when Jesus called them. So a lot happened over that time, beginning with how Jesus um, um, poured himself into, into that. You know, that's always encouraged me that the apostles were imperfect and didn't get it because as imperfect as they were, he still chose them, still worked with them, and that's been an encouragement, even to the point, if you remember, that Paul, later on, in the epistles has to confront Peter when he withdraws fellowship from uh, the Gentiles, even at the question of them being admitted into the church and having the full show, full, the full spirit, the full fellowship of Christian, being Christians is, right. is settled. And Paul still has to confront him later. Sure, yeah. And, and by the way, that's an example of that, that even when you have had some kind of powerful impartation of the spirit, right. it means that it doesn't mean that you then walk a straight line uh, because the, 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 the reference you're talking about is after Peter gave this big message on the day of Pentecost mm -hmm. and saw 3,000 people come to, um, to, to Christ that um, at, at that moment, 
and have and a great yet, vision about and have and have a, a vision, yes. And yet Peter um, exhibited such prejudice that Paul had to confront him. After all of that, we we are all works in progress. All of us. So we we never arrive. We're all arriving. We're all getting there. We're all growing, developing, allowing Christ more and more to be at work in us. Yeah. The the thing that I kept thinking about was because you mentioned it a couple of different times was Judas. So just because the where I went with it was as you mentioned, the people he picks, right, are not people that anybody would pick for this position. They're not people that would would do. And, and, and so the thought is, if you're building leadership, it's about picking people. It's about building into people. And then you mentioned, and sometimes they're going to fail you and something, right? And, and I think that, like, that's one of the lessons we learned from Judas is that this method, even Jesus only was 90, 91% successful, right? I did the math. <laughs> I did it. I took it. I just it. It was, it was 91.7. So, okay, 92. 11, 11 12. Yeah. Right. But, like, and, 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 and you could argue, well, no, it was 100%. But the point is, the way we would measure success, it, was, it wasn't 100%. And, and I think that's something to remember when we're talking about building of leadership is that even if we're following in the steps of Jesus, if we're really following in the steps of Jesus, there are going to be people that aren't going to, but that doesn't mean we stop That's doing right. it that way. That's right. It means we keep going because even <laughs> Jesus had Judas, and so we just have to keep going. That's right. So. Well, even on, <clears throat> even on Peter's big speech, 3,000 people believed. There were probably people that didn't. There were. That's right. A significant number. That's right. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, so in that same setting where you had the Holy Spirit move upon 3,000 that they, that they, they had no um, they just really had to, to respond. Um, there probably were some people who slept through what Peter said. Uh, and, and, and there were some who were uh, paying attention to the, 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 the Pentecost uh, rituals that they were supposed to be doing because they were actually there in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And all of that, all of that was going on. While these 3,000 were under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We can add that Jesus got in trouble from the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability. <laughs> That's right. That, 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 that Judas was not properly vetted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe to shove in one other thing, Pastor Andy, I had a, a guy at seminary who brought, brought in for leadership and it turned my head upside down. And where he started was basically by saying that most of us wouldn't fit the requirements that we now have. And this is kind of your point, Linda. We would not meet the requirements that now us has for someone to do our job. And the way he pointed to it was, he says, what you're looking for is fat people. And we all went, what? Fat people? He meant F-A-T, fat people, available, and teachable. There's a lot to be said for people who just keep showing up. I mean, you may have the person in right in front of you and they just won't be like, or hot. you're like trying to see past them to the person you want yeah. when the person God's given you who will keep showing up is right there. Is there? That's a different kind of an approach. But then if you remember that you also probably weren't the person somebody else was looking for, it makes it a little bit easier to, to swallow. And I think it boils down to that Jesus is our ultimate example. And we, as much as we, like you said, it's progression, we're never going to have the skills that Jesus had. We are not Jesus. And so, <laughs> you know what I mean? So if we use him as our model, there's, you know, but, but he used all these different skill sets, however imperfect. And look at how beautiful that was. Weirdly, that's the plan. Yeah, weirdly. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. We are going to, to run through this handout um, pretty quickly because I don't want you to accuse me of um, going overtime. 
That should make me worried about time. <laughs> <laughs> so start yeah, those, that now. <laughs> those anomalies do exist sometimes. <laughs> you don't have to pay you overtime. We're good. <laughs> um. All right, so uh, let's just start with um, everything rises and falls in leadership. Um, I just mean by that, that that leadership is so significant, so important. We can't ignore it, we can't um, sideline it. Um, it it's important. Um, typically when God wanted to do something, something great, something of significance, he would normally uh, call out a leader, select a leader, choose a leader, have a leader identified in some way um, because leadership is just needed. I talked this morning about the, um, the, the problem of leaderlessness. When there's no leadership or there's bad leadership, um, that's a huge problem for, for everybody. So, so we, we can't devalue the, the, the benefit of leadership, right? And leadership is influence. That is uh, that that on your hand out there. Um, if we if we were to boil leadership down to one word, it's influence. But certainly remember that that you can be inappropriately influential. You can try to influence inappropriately, and and there, there are some ways in which that is very obvious. And then there are other ways that it's kind of subtle and, and people wrestle with whether this is okay or not. You know, for example, if I, if I wanted to be uh, the moderator for the connecting church, and I just felt, I, I just feel God calling me to, to that role. Um, and uh, there's going to be a business meeting and there's going to be an election of officers and so on. Uh, but prior to the meeting, um, I, 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 just, uh, I just give a gift of uh, $50 to uh, people in the congregation mm -hmm. uh, with a little card that says, um, whatever, vote for me or something like that. Mm -hmm. That would be, there, there's nobody who would have any difficulties seeing that 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 is that is wrong. That, that, that is that that is misplaced. There's no place for that at all in the church in the kingdom of God. That's obviously wrong. So there are there are times when when um, inappropriate influence is very very obvious uh, that that it's wrong. But there are other times when uh, we may not be so sure. And, and we may be doing things or people may be doing things that, that are borderline and we have to rest with them or we're just not sure. But, but the truth is that, that leadership is influence. Anywhere you are, where, where you go, you want to have an influence. You want to have an impact, okay? But as spiritual leaders, we are called to do that in a way that honors God. That, that is just a key thing. There, it's, it, it, it's not wrong to be influential. We want to be influential. That's really what it means to be solid and light. It means to have influence. It means to have impact. It means to, to, to do something about the, 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 the environment where you are, to make a difference in the environment. That's influence. But our influence must always honor God. God is right in the center of that equation at all times. We're not called to try to influence on our own, in our own strength, by our own means, um, using our own desires and ambitions. No, we've got to bring all of that under the subjection of the Lord God Almighty. Let him call the shots. We are just his um, channels. All right, so seven ways to influence people, and I want to do this, and I, I, we may not get through all of this, but, but that's okay. Um, we'll, uh, we'll do this again next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, number one, force. Force. I mean, people actually 
rather it goes by force. And there are two kinds of force, A, violent, and B, nonviolent. So I'm giving this to you quickly. So seven ways to influence people. One is by force. That is, there are people who just really try to, to force something on, on you. And sometimes it's done uh, violently, just speaking in general. And, and there are nonviolent ways to do that, but, but force, all right? Number two, intimidation. So a second way that, that uh, people can be influenced, and by the way, um, these, these ways to influence people that, that I'm gonna talk about, um, they, they sometimes work, or they, they work on different levels and they work in different uh, circumstances, and this is why people do them. Um, because sometimes they do work. Uh, intimidation. Mm -hmm. The good news is that intimidation is often the quickest way to get results. Everyone hops when the leader says jump. Uh, that's what the lion tries to do. Mm -hmm. The bad news is that this method is short lived. It causes turnover in organizations. No healthy person stays in this kind of environment very long. So you may get some results by trying to influence by intimidation, but it, it's not going to last. And, 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 and people, um, generally healthy people, are, are, are just not gonna stick around in that kind of environment. Okay. Um, three, manipulation. Manipulation. That's another way that, that, that people uh, seek to influence. Characteristics of manipulative leadership. A, one person wins, the other loses. So manipulative leadership usually has that, a win-lose kind of um, situation. B, control of the situation is one-sided. So there's a one-sided control. Um, somebody is manipulating, somebody is pulling the strings, um, um, and it's usually kind of their, it's their show. You know? Um, C, the followers feel they have been taken advantage of. So at some point when there is manipulative behavior, um, somebody is going to really just start getting an, an uneasy and uncomfortable feeling. I, I just feel like I've been taken advantage of. D, a we slash them perspective sets in. So in manipulative leadership, you, you, are, you are typically going to set up a we them um, situation. You're going to have uh, some people um, uh, leaning one way, others leaning another way, and it becomes um, it, it, it becomes uh, <coughs> uh, divisive. Um, we versus them. E people begin to be suspicious of each other. So, so trust is usually kind of broken down. Suspicions build. And if people start vying for power and control, people start vying for power and control because they, they understand that if, if things are going to happen the way they would like it to happen, they've got to have some power and they've got to get some control. That's, that's, that, that's, the, that's the environment, that's the manipulation. Um, number nine, uh, sorry, G. G, there is personal kingdom building going on. Personal kingdom building. So um, there, there, there are people who are, who are just trying to build their own little kingdom and having their own little agenda uh, and, and they're building their own little following. Yeah, and, and unfortunately that happens in the church sometimes. But all of those are characteristics of manipulated um, um, leadership. But it's one of the ways that, that influence can be um, sought. All right, number four. Exchange, exchange. The pros of exchange, it is fair and just. 
All parties have agreed to the conditions. It is influence based upon contract. That is, um, I agree to this, you agree to that. There's no hidden agenda. Usually everything is kind of laid out. So, so everybody knows what it is that they're agreeing to. Um, everyone wins to a degree. The cons of exchange. It only works until one of the parties get a better ex gets a better exchange somewhere else. Right? So yes, for the moment, um, I this may be okay with me. But if I get a better offer, a better exchange somewhere else, then then I'm, I'm going to take that because usually part of the agreement is that yeah, I can I can do that. Um, it is ultimately self-serving. And uh, each one or all are looking out for their own best interests. So everybody wants what's best for them, even when you have exchange. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to get what's best for me. Um, um, and I'd and I like you to agree to that. Um, number five, persuasion. That is really just uh, trying to, to uh, get someone to, to, to move your way, to think your way. So you try to persuade them. Um, it could be by arguments. It could be uh, by promises, whatever it is. But you are uh, persuading uh, and then motivation is number six. The word motivate is taken from the same root as movement. We are moved when a leader speaks to our, these four things, our needs, the things we need to have in our day-to-day -day life, our interests, things we're curious about or have an interest in, our concerns, things we're concerned about or fearful of, and our dreams, things we deeply want in our heart of hearts. So in one sense, as we look at these seven ways to influence people, we're kind of, uh, we're kind of moving from the worst to the, to, to the best, right? So force, we started with force, uh, which is really bad, I mean, we even have the word violent in, in that one. So that, that's a giveaway. That's, that's really bad. Um, uh, so, so force and then um, 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 intimidation, manipulation, exchange. So, so we're gradually getting a little better, right? Um, motivation is number six. You, you, you try to speak to or communicate to um, per, uh, uh, people's needs, interests, concerns, and dreams. And in helping you to do that, you ask these three questions. What do you sing about? In other words, what, what makes you happy? What, what, what brings joy to your heart? And you try to speak to that as you, as you seek to influence. What do you cry about? Uh, what are the things that that would make you not happy so that you can understand what to avoid of, of someone that you're trying to influence and then what do you dream about um, if if you if, if you could have your own way what it is that that you would really want to have um, you could dream about so but then number seven is what i believe is 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 true spiritual leadership, which is, uh, I'm going to call it spiritual authority. We seek to influence through spiritual authority. Now, uh, somebody's going to say, you know, authority is not even a simple Baptist word. Um, <clears throat> so why do we even have it here? Well, you know, um, obviously I'm not talking about anything that is unhealthy or unbiblical. Um, uh, and, and, and some of us may have a problem with the word authority, but uh, it's very biblical. Um, it's not a bad word. 
Not a bad word. Uh, Matthew 10, verse 1, we read it. Jesus gave his disciples the authority. So this type of leadership stems from these four uh, pairs of things. A, honoring and serving people. Honoring and serving people. We, that is, I'm saying that we, we derive, uh, we, we develop, we build our spiritual authority on these things. Honoring and serving people. B, anointing and God's presence. Anointing and God's presence. And in this sense, um, there is there is some of this that uh, it's just God doing something in and through us. We have we have no other way to explain it or to or to measure it. But there is just an anointing of God that that is upon us when we yield ourselves to Him that helps us to have influence. So that there are times when we are doing things. And we don't even know uh, where did we even get from? Uh, uh, where did we even get the things that we're saying? You know, I literally have had experiences where uh, I have responded to someone that asked me something that before that second, before <laughs> that time when that person was asked, I never had a thought about it. But it just it just comes from something. Or I'm, I'm, or I'm doing something. Uh, you know, uh, uh, when I, I I've learned um, I've, I've learned to share the gospel in, using several methods. One of them is, is EE, evangelism explosion, which is a long outline. Uh, you know, um, um, uh, um, Heaven is a free gift that's not earned or deserved. You know, man is a sinner and he cannot save himself. Uh, but God is merciful, therefore he doesn't want to punish us, but he's also just, um, therefore um, uh, he, he must punish our sin. And um, the way God took care of that is in the person of Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, rose from the dead, to pay the penalty for our sins so that he may offer to us a place in heaven which we can only receive by faith. Uh, faith is not just intellectual ascent. It's not merely temporal faith. Um, it is trusting in Jesus Christ alone for the hope of eternal life. You know, that's kind of an outline. Um, I, I know that, that several times I, uh, uh, so I memorized the E outline, right? And I have forgotten parts of it. And I have forgotten some of the verses. And the person still prays to receive prayers. <laughs> um, so um, and, and and so to me, you know, I'm 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 kind of beating up on myself because I'm saying, oh man, I did, I, I left out that part. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I actually want to go back because I remember it, you know, after I've gone past it, and I want to go back and, and put it in. <laughs> uh, but but uh, the person comes to prays to receive prayers. Um, I uh, I remember sharing with someone and used the E outline. They prayed to receive Christ. They're walking with the Lord today. But then later on, the person became a member of our church, and and we're doing the training in uh, with EE. And so she she now becomes a part of the training, and and so uh, and so she's going through it, and she said, "Oh." But that's that's what you were telling me. That that's that's what when you came to my house. That's that's what you were telling me. Uh, I, so I said yes. Uh, she said, well, you know, I didn't know that it's something that that you had memorized and all of that. Um, no, the point I'm making is that I go through all of that and I mess up many times, and God still um, allows somebody to 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 come to Him, uh, because when we submit ourselves to Him. He does things through us that that it's just not us. It's not us. 
We do our preparation, we, we do everything that we need to do, and we absolutely must do that, but we must also understand that God is going to do some things that will make it absolutely clear that this is not you, because you couldn't do that. You can do it. For jars of clay, uh, Paul says, um, and 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 uh, we're jars of clay, so that it may be known that the the unsearchable power of Christ rests upon us, because we do some things that we just know that it's not us. So anointing and God's presence is part of what gives us our spiritual authority as leaders. And we need to use that, but not abuse it or misuse it. Because that can also happen. There are people who think that, you know, because God used me in this way one day, then man, I can just tell everybody that God says, and then they're supposed to follow because I say, you know, God said this. No. It also comes from C. This, the, the spiritual authority, that type of leadership, comes from giftedness and competency. Giftedness and competency. In other words, God places his gift <coughs> excuse me, in us, right? In each of us, as, as believers, we have um, spiritual gifts, and we're to use them in the work of, of, of his ministry. We're to use them to serve the Lord, and we are to do our best to develop those gifts, become better at what God has given to us. So competency is, is, is developing a mastery of what God has entrusted to you. So if I have been given the gift of teaching, it doesn't mean that I don't have to study. Because I have the gift of teaching, so I stand up before people and I open my mouth and the Holy Spirit will fill it with the words and they will come out. <coughs> I think you recognize all of that for what it is. Um, just say in your mind what all of that is. <laughs> all right? Yeah, no, no. As a matter of fact, if I have the gift of teaching, I have more responsibility than those who don't have that gift to study. I need to study more. That's part of what, the, what God giving me that gift um, uh, says that I am to, to do and be responsible for. He has given that to me, so I'm now responsible to master it by preparing and studying and, and going above and beyond what the average person does. So, so that my spiritual authority is going to also come from my giftedness and my competency. When I demonstrate that I am learning better and better to do what God has gifted me and entrusted me to do. So I'm not, I'm not being mediocre about what, what I'm doing and what God has called me to do. Um, I am always improving. All right, D, this type of leadership also stems from conviction and passion. Conviction and passion. So um, when I demonstrate convictions about things, I can demonstrate why I have those convictions. I can demonstrate uh, the basis for those convictions and I can speak with passion, not just empty passion. And that doesn't mean that that um, once I get louder, it means that uh, it means that there's more value to what I'm saying. Or if I pound the podium, then uh, you better listen up. Uh, no, but when I have a God-given and God-driven passion that's going to be seen, that's going to be heard, that's going to be demonstrated, that's going to be understood. And it's going to, to have a, a part in, in where my spiritual authority comes from. 
Library is running over. <laughs> yes, it is. Sorry, sorry, I did that. All right, so an equation at the bottom of page two character, who we are, plus communication, how we say equals influence. So character, who we are, plus communication equals influence. So my character, um, everything that I am in terms of my integrity, my honesty, and so on, plus how I communicate what I want to say um, equals influence. All right, let's run through uh, page three quickly. Why do people listen and respond to leaders? Ten reasons. One, relationships. Why do people listen and respond to leaders? Because of relationships, because of who you know. That is who you have um, been developing a relationship with, who you uh, take the time to get to know, who you take the time to ask about themselves, and, and, um, and you, you spend time learning those things about them. Two, sacrifice. People listen and respond to leaders um, because of sacrifice. That is because of what you've suffered. That is, you know, you've, you've taken some hits. You've taken some blows. You've given up some things. But you've, but you've stuck with it. So, so people are going to, to, to know those things and understand those things. And, and they're going to, that's going to contribute to how they listen to you. Three, insight, because of what you know. Okay. So when you are able to speak insightfully into things, you, you're just able to, to, um, to see some things that maybe the average person doesn't see. Uh, people are going to take notice of that, of insight. Um, uh, four, experience experience because of what you've achieved. Um, you know, do some things. <laughs> if you are, if you're leading, if you are in ministry, you know, just do some things uh, so that people will see that you've actually done something um, because of what you've achieved. People pay attention to that and it will give you um, uh, some opportunity for them to listen to you. Um, five abilities because of what you are able to do. So again, you show them, I have these abilities, I can do these things, and I do them. I, I, I give up myself in these ways. Um, people 